Welcome to Brave Bold Brilliant. I'm here today with the one and only legend. I can, I can use that word for you, Jonathan Davis, oh, can't no. I? <laughs> no, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Still embarrassing. <laughs> not at all. So listen, you've had such a stellar career, um, but it's not all been about rugby, right? You've had quite a few different um, kind of reiterations, I think, in terms of what you're doing now and where you started life. But I want to go back to the beginning, if we can, to yeah. start. Okay. Okay, and then we're going to go from there. What was life like growing up as a kid? Well, it's sort of never thought I'd be ended up doing things like this. That's the first thing. You know, I come from a little village um, called Tripsar, and it's just, it was kind of a mining, open cast kind of place, you know, and um, there's steel works around, so most of my, my, my friends worked in those industries. Um, but basically, just a, a small little West Wales village, and um, you know we got on with everyone. Just normal school, small classes. Um, spoke well, but those who spoke Welsh went to a Welsh class. Those who spoke, spoke English went to an English class. Um, and you kind of knew. I lived in a council estate of two hundred houses, and I thought I think I knew everyone, everyone house. Um, and you got to know most of the village. So, and anyone new came in, they're like, oh, bang on with these people now. <laughs> so it was very, very small, but yeah, you know, thoroughly, uh, you know, I was I was loved and um, it was a great place to grow up. Yeah, so you, you have a sister, right? I have a sister two years younger than me. <laughs> I think she's the boss of the family, but when it comes to big things, I'm the boss, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> no, we, we were, you know, quite, quite close because... Um, yeah, Unfortunately, my dad passed, so we were left with my grandmother, the two mm. of us, and she had, um, well, we didn't know at the time, but she had uh, dementia. We just thought she was a bit doolally like but uh, ultimately, you know, it's kind of forced, not forced us together, but, you know, we had to kind of look after each other and look after grandmother. Well, yeah. My mum and dad were away. Wow, wow, gosh, yes. And in fact, I, I was I was listening to some... Um, Caroline saying that That's you right. used to practice your signature. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I, I can't remember doing so. I don't, don't, they, don't most kids do that? You know, or, you know, because a lot of them go, oh, I'd like to be famous. And they don't know what they want to be famous for. You know, now it's changed. You've got influencers and YouTubers and all that, reality stars. So, it was just one of those things, you know, one day I did this and then she, she unfortunately, she remembered it till today. <laughs> She's and still had, talking about it. the opportunity to use it against me. <laughs> but on a serious note, when you first sort of had your big break in, in rugby um, and when you got signed for Neath, did you, was that what you'd always dreamed of? Did you know that this was going to be the path for you and you kind of envisaged that future career that you had or, or did it not really happen not, like that at the time? Not really. I, I had so many knockbacks through my kind of young kind of life um you're not only on the personal side of my dad but also on the, on the rugby side because yeah I played for a small village played for a, a small school Gwen it had a huge reputation tradition of developing international stars but because sometimes when you play against the bigger schools for example the Swansea district or the Cardiff district you have so many so much choice and we only had three schools so when you play in those games you don't have much opportunity to shine. Um, and that's why I love stories of late developers coming through because they come from a similar situation that I had. So, no, it was very different. I tried and I kept on trying. I kept on trying, but didn't have a Welsh cap or you know, didn't get recognised. And just kept on working hard and, and playing for Trimsada, you know, through the playing for the school, playing for the youth, and then playing for the first team. So I, I never thought that that would happen really and you know, i just thought that i'd um, i'd enjoy what i what i enjoyed and i did it for the enjoyment mm. and if success came with it you know so be it so i worked hard because my you know it was playing with my mates every saturday training every tuesday thursday with them so i i, I really enjoyed it and you just took the knockbacks on the chin and just worked harder i suppose I really hope you're enjoying the podcast, Brave, Bold, Brilliant. And I am so excited because we now have a dedicated website as well, which is www.brave-bold-brilliant.com. And on there, you're going to find loads of free resources to help you with your leadership journey, help you scale up your business. So do check out the website. And of course, if you want to actually have more direct support from me, whether that's one-to-one -one business mentoring, whether it's executive leadership development programs for your teams or group masterminds or even bespoke advisory work that I can
can help you with. Do not hesitate to contact me and the team. And remember, whatever you're doing, it's by being brave and bold that you're going to unlock your brilliant. Enjoy the episode. Mm, yeah. And who was influencing you around that time? Because you come off, you come from a rugby point of view. Yeah. You'd come off the back of the you know golden era of the seventies and a lot of those inspiring yeah. players yeah. that you would have been watching as a as a kid growing up, right? Yeah, very very lucky. You know, to grow up in an, in an area where you are Tlenthi and you played against your Cardiffs and your Swansea. So I was very lucky to afford to watch all these great players. Um, but it, it was weird because I suppose my dad was my mentor, first of all, uh, and my school teacher, Miriam Davis. But I had a lot of mentors in kind of in, in the village and they weren't, they just gave me advice here, not, not maybe not one person, but because they surrounded me and looked after me because my dad passed. That they kind of, I had, I took little bits of of everyone mm. and learned what was good, what wasn't good. I got into a few scrapes as a young kid, and I got, into, you know, I remember my mum telling me when I left school, I was playing cards after after work, and then I lose all my salary in cards in one day. So my mum, my mum went down and told the guys in the village. I said, "Don't take money off my son anymore." So you know, but you you learn things that way, like you know. So it was. Just that's the way it was. I just I just listened to a lot of people, and mm. later on in my career, I, I I think I realized then I did have proper mentors. So my dad and my teacher, Marion Davis. Then I went a bit kind of wayward and for a bit, and then I I kind of got some mentors towards the maybe my eighteens or nineteens again, so twenties. Mm. So I was. But I just listen. I just listen to good advice. That's all. That's, I think it's key, no matter where you come from, because. Anyone could surprise you with giving you some advice, you know, and, and you don't know where you're going to go, who you're going to meet, and who you sat next door to. No, you're right, actually, because when you walk in a room, yeah. there might be two yeah, people, yeah. ten yeah. people, hundreds of people. You never yeah. really and at, know. At who's the there, time right? in this area, you wouldn't, you know, come from Sara and you would meet, you know, you know, you'd be sat next door to. But then, as you kind of develop and evolve and see the world, then you have no idea who sat next door to you in places. Mm. How old were you when your dad passed away? Then uh, twelve when he was diagnosed with cancer, then fourteen when he passed. Wow. So, um, yeah, tough. it toughens you up a little bit. Yeah, I bet. it's. Um, and I guess that maybe that's also how you and Caroline kind of bonded together yeah, and became so. close through I that difficult so. time. Yeah, right? and the realisation of how tough it was for my mum. Mm. So it does harden you up from a very young age. Um, so, but, you know, I, I hear some sort of things, some people are in worse situations. So you got to make the best of, um, you know, what, what's, what's been given, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So so with the whole sort of start in your career, watching back footage, you seemed incredibly confident right from the beginning. Was that was that the case? Or did you have times when you were like, oh, my gosh, can I do this? I feel, you know, imposter syndrome kicking in, especially as your career becomes bigger and bigger and you, you're much more becoming the spotlight and the media star that you became? I think every game. Really? I, I think I got nervous every game. And yeah. in respect, of, you know, because I played cricket for the village, then I played soccer for the village and... And then the rugby for the village, and I was in, I was nervous every game because I didn't want to let myself down, didn't want to let my friends down or, or my teammates. So I had that kind of burden on me, and I, and it's the control. A lot of people say controlling the fear of failure. Mm. So and I, so I had it all the way through, and when I had the knockbacks, I just thought, oh, keep on going, keep on going. But then when it came to the big break, in as in Neath, as you said, oh, mm. I definitely, I, I felt like you know, because I didn't know. Was I good enough? So I hadn't trained with them. I'd rung me on a Sunday. I played on a Tuesday. Hadn't met any of the team. Hadn't trained any of the team. Didn't know what they were like. Didn't actually know the names or who they were, to be honest. Mm. So stepping that, to step in that environment, thinking, you know, am I good enough? What's going to happen today? So it is, it is kind of really nerve-wracking. And I had that throughout my career, even to a degree when I was you know, Company Wales, League of Union, I still had that kind of sense of, right, i got to do well here. I don't let anyone down here because I, I, I loved the team that I played for mm. and the boys that I played with and the fans that came. So it was, it was an, I, I, did I enjoy it? Not to build it maybe, but I kind of know that I look back and then go, okay, maybe that's what kind of drove me, I suppose. 
Mm, it's funny, isn't it? Because when people look from, from the outside in, they see, yeah. they see, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and they have a perception that all yeah. the it's easy and oh, it's all right yeah. for you. And yeah. actually, behind that, there's always yeah. I think I'm know, lucky. To... I've always had this kind of persona where I'm I'm in control and I can and I know what I'm doing. Mm. And you know, when you when you go onto a rugby pitch and when you're playing in the position that I played, I think you have to have that. You have to have this or or of confidence, maybe arrogance sometimes, but you have to in a way. So it was to, to, to be able to hide how emotionally unstable and sick I was before, you know, 10 minutes before the game, turn out and go, right, okay, this is me now, this is my show, or, you know, I will show. Then it's it was weird how I kind of looked so, so confident. And, I, and, I, and it's the same now. When I do things on television, when I get up to speak, I've still got that nervous energy about me. Mm. I'm thinking, what if it goes flat, falls flat in his face? And I mean, that comes from all the knockbacks that I had. But now, as you get older, you, you I think you realise how, how you kind of control it all. Mm. So if someone that's listening to this thinking, oh my gosh, I never, never thought that, that Jonathan would be saying that, you know, you had, you had to work on your self-confidence and stuff. What are some of the yeah. things that, or advice you can give to people? Because it doesn't matter whether you're in sport, business, whatever you're doing think, in life. I think you go moments. back to basics, I think. Because yeah. if you, it's like, I, I'll give you a different analogy, right? When I was in school, I didn't, I didn't work hard enough in school. So when I came to the exam day, right? I knew I hadn't, I wasn't prepared. Mm. So then you're into the unknown and all of a sudden you fail. And I was really, and I was really disappointed because I look back and I wish I would have kind of concentrated more on schoolwork and me be going to university and people say, oh, you done all right. You done. But then again, yeah, yeah that's so be it. But maybe that's what I wanted to do. Okay. So then from the lack of preparation from my school days, I learned from that to say, right, okay, I don't want to ever feel like that again. Mm. So when I, you know, although you get nervous, you sit, you sit back and you go, right, okay, done, I've done the work, I'm ready to go, you know. So it's just, it's you're not nervous of the situation, maybe you're nervous of the of the outcome. But if you've prepared for it, in certain situations, in sport in general, you know, you can't worry about the outcome, but you put the work in. So you've got, you know, then you've got to adjust and change things in sport. But I just think it's like if you put the work in and you, you know you you know what you what you're doing. Mm. It's people the nerves are different. Yeah. People are nervous about different things. You know, even my family, like you know, people are getting nervous about different you know different things all the time. So you can't tell someone specifically, right? Oh, this is what I you know this is what I did. But I can't tell you what what makes you calm or what mm. makes you focused. Or it just, but if you know you've got you've worked hard and you can't and you haven't you've you haven't left any stone unturned, then all of a sudden you should have the answer to everything that, that happened. So it's just that preparation. You know, it's like the old adage, but preparation is key, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I mean, got so many times through my career where I've been the only woman in the boardroom yeah. or whatever. It's been, yeah, oh yeah. gosh, you've got a northern accent. You I don't know, fit in with all these posh, posh well, economists. Sometimes you have to wing it though. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you know, you sat there, irrespective of, you know, where you're from, what your mm. accent is, you know, what sex you are, you know, it, it's just going to go, right, you know, I'm here. I'm here because... I deserve to be here. So let's see what happens. Mm, yeah, I always think, well, if you've done the best you can, then it, yeah. what more could... But if you haven't, and no. you know deep down you've not no. really, you've, yeah. you know, then that's different because then you'll yeah. be kicking yourself, right? Yeah, and I ask, when I, was, when I was sat, you know, waiting on the bus for going to go to school and all the kids are talking, and, you know, there's some bright kids in, in school, and I knew they were, they were like top of the class and I was going are they prepared for them and they're you know a lot brighter than I am and I'm like I am prepared <laughs> that's all I'm going to say <laughs> so that was it you know? so again that horrible feeling of waiting for exam results and I remember one school teacher he's never having these days so they start off they go you know in the class and everyone goes right um, I always remember the name Larry Finity. 100% well done, Larry. And they go down in the 90s and 70s, and then all the kids are down here. <laughs> I was sat there, and I was going down, it's going down at 50, and I failed. Okay, and I, go, and I know she, and I always remember it was chemistry. And she went, uh, 32, Jonathan Davis, 32%. And you're thinking, oh, that would, that would be class is bullying now. Of course, it would have been that mental anguish. <laughs> the kids are like, yes, oh, you, know, yeah. well, you just go, oh, well, that's it. The embarrassment of it all. But I knew it. I couldn't blame anyone else. I couldn't yeah. blame a teacher. So what's the point of blaming a teacher? I, it was my fault. I didn't, I didn't, you know, 
revise enough. So I, I didn't want that feeling again in my mm. sport infield. Mm. So that's what drove me. Even though I got knockbacks, that's what drove me. I like in the field, you know, my kids are going out like, oh, you know, you're speaking to someone and they tell me, yeah, no, what did you get for that, Dad? And I go, yeah, I tell them. And they go, oh, God, why did you get that? And it's not because of I'm doing that now. It's because of what I did the last 40 years, I suppose, and the hard work that I went into to get to there. So, uh, 100%. Yeah. yeah, it's all those 1%, 1%, yeah. isn't it? Just it's leading on, yeah, yeah. To, to, you know, yeah. to being successful. Yeah. Or, I mean, I love it as well when it, when people, you know, say something, say someone's business doesn't work out or they don't get the promotion or whatever's happened, you've failed at something. What people, people will love that, don't <laughs> oh, they? Oh, they love it. They love it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a very nice British trait. And I think it is a little bit no, cultural. It is. But um, it's almost the, the sort of the, the sick satisfaction people get from seeing someone that was doing well, sort yeah. of, you know, oh, oh how the mighty have fallen. Yeah. And yet they don't see all of the no. successes that have no. happened. Okay, it might have end, ended it, but you've learned a lot along yeah. the way and you'll go on and do something yeah. great with it, right? I remember Cliff, remember, remember Cliff Morgan. He played rugby for Wales, played for Lions. He was head of broadcasting. He was a comic. He was just such a gem of a guy, a brilliant voice on television. And he, he was from up the valley somewhere, around the valley, and he lived in London and all this. And um, he remember, he, I remember sitting down there once, and he said, oh, with Wales, you see, whatever, you see, from where you're from, where I'm from, if you try something and fail, they hate you. If you, do, if you try something and succeed, they hate you. <laughs> so if you don't try anything... They love you. Yeah. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Saying, oh, yeah, I suppose it is. I suppose it is. Yeah. So it's, uh, that's, that's a bit different. And you get, irrespective of where you are, what you do, how successful you are, you're going to get people who are jealous of it. You can't please everyone. And they all don't get it. And the more I'm understanding that, and the more I couldn't give a monkey's Yeah. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, well, you've learned, earned the right yeah, now, you haven't yeah, you? Yeah, to, you have, to a yeah. certain and, degree. To yeah, a certain and there's so many opinions now on social media and everything, and you think, why do, why do people take any notice of it now? It's mm. just weird. So. How do you cope with the media? Because you've had times in your career where they've not always been kind, right? And you've no. taken a lot of flack for, you know, post that Romania game was probably pretty brutal, I would imagine, for you. But there's probably been multiple examples. And yeah. um, and that stuff I, I would expect is quite hurtful as well at the yeah, time and having is. to deal with it. How do you deal with, uh, with that when uh, it's playing out in the public eye like that? Um, it is difficult, first of all, I think, because you're not used to it. And it's mm. like, but again, I, I relate back to, again, you know, how we was and my dad passed and I go, this is nothing about that. It's yeah. nothing, you know. So it's the way, you, it, the way you relate back to things and what's important and what's not important. Some, you know, sometimes if I'm on the game, like the Romanian game, I thought I played okay. We lost. I was captain. I take the flak. I understand, but mm. you know the team didn't play well. But I'm I'm the one who takes the flak, and I and I and I'll take it on the chin. You know that's the way it is. But then you know sometimes on other matters where I've made mistakes. You know, off in my personal life, I've made mistakes, and as everyone else does, and then it's on the papers. You know, I've made it's 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 my fault then. Mm. I know I've got to own up to it. So I made a lot, you know, I've a lot of mistakes in my life, but I, you learn through them. So, and I think that I knew myself when I was being slagged off in the papers or telling you were playing. I knew if I played badly, I knew if, uh, what had happened, if it was my fault, if it was a team's fault. But you, collectively, you take it. And I think if it, it, it all depends on your mindset, mm. because I was doing it for nothing. Yes, I want to talk about that as well. So yeah. you're thinking, right, hang on now, I'm doing this for nothing, and it's slagged off by everyone. I'm playing in front of 50, you know, 60,000 people, and then I'm back in work next day. So it, I just it just had a different perspective on it all. I always had perspective on who I was, what I was doing, and who's, who was slagging me off. Mm. So I took it all, and I thought, well, you know, sometimes I fronted up to it, sometimes I just sat back to it. But ultimately, it was, I knew, I just... I would say, don't worry what you can't control. Yeah. That's, that, was, that, that was key, I think. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So you, you referred to the fact that it wasn't professionalised rugby, no. rugby union at that point. So you were pay, everyone was playing for free. Yeah. You weren't getting paid for anything. You had, yes. had to hold jobs down yeah. and probably 
in, into a certain extent fund stuff out of your own pocket on top of that presumably yeah. travel and yeah. expenses and stuff so how how did you manage that like in, in reality what were you doing to earn money while you were playing because oh, it must you, have been here difficult we go. Here we go. <laughs> right so i left school i was i lost a bit of discipline and i was banned from for play for trimsara and trimsara and youth were banned for a month because i played for trimsara and rather than play for a county side and a, they found out, but what the family done to my what Trimsan had done to my family, I, I was no choice. I had to play for the village because they supported me and my family when they when we needed it. Yeah. So but, but I, I made a choice of playing for Trimsan, so they banned me from playing for Welsh schools or whatever. And then I got lost a bit of discipline. And I left school. I wasn't happy. Either. So I went straight into painter and decorating. So I passed my city and girls painter and decorating, not a very good one. Um, then I went I let the open cast opened up in Trimsara so I worked on an open cast um, for a bit and then when when Neath came along I couldn't I was working 6 till 6 then going training and then 6 till 12 then playing on a Saturday wow so you know, and I couldn't I couldn't cope with both of them so the manager in Neath Brian Thomas who came he was a good mentor he looked at a job in as a um, uh industrial painter and decorator like on the commercial side introduced me to a guy called John Eventon and uh, Neil O'Halloran both of them became good mentors as well so allowed me to train and uh, so that's what I did I just worked and then at the end I went back clearly I went as a financial advisor with a friend of mine Gerard who I'm still very friendly with so I just balanced all of that work with um, you know with playing and travelling and, and the good thing was I think because Everybody's professional in this day and age. You know, so many amateur sports people, mm. and if they are amateur, you know, you're getting sponsors for it, so they're not amateur. So when when I we did a television program called the Slam the Eighties, and I think people realised, oh, you went to New Zealand, you went to Tonga, yeah. And when you're getting battered, and then you're doing it for like for nothing, <laughs> and you're losing money at home as well. So I, I'm glad that came out actually because the people had a sense of realization of how, mm. how difficult it was and. You were doing it for nothing. You were representing mm. your country, but because you know you you loved you loved playing, and we didn't know any different then. And I think now I look at all these sportsmen. Do they enjoy it as much as we do? Because it is their job, mm. so they worry about it all the time because it's their job and their income. So if that's taken away. All of a sudden, the, the whole world collapses with them. So we had kind of two lives: a sporting life, which was my hobby. Even when I went rugby league, I still thought it was my hobby. And I was and I loved it, so it was diff- there's a different mindset to where you are, what you do, and I and I look at places on it on huge money, and I look at them. Why, why can't you enjoy yourself? Mm. Yeah, we had a, well, I love playing. You know, that was I couldn't wait for Saturday afternoon to play. It was yeah, crazy. I loved it. It was a tough time though, wasn't it? Because you know, in the eighties, you have got the backdrop of the miners' yeah, strike, it was, Thatcher. Yeah, it was. You know, real yeah. economic deprivation yeah, it was. you know in in, was. in lots of parts of, of, of the country of the uk you know yeah, in the everywhere. northeast but everywhere. wales in particular you know high unemployment all that's going on you've got this almost um unrest civil unrest going on i mean it was quite extreme yeah. right the yeah, a, lot of the boys, a lot of the boys are, some are miners yeah some are policemen so two sides huh? from a small village yeah I mean, yeah you know so it was, it was it was it was just crazy you forget, and you forget about it mm. but i think Put it, you know, putting my sportsman's cap on. You could just bring the whole town together. Because when we went and when we played in Neath, and I used to come from Clancy, I drive up and I come off the motorway, and all of a sudden you had a traffic jam. And it was just you knew like these people, you know, how bad their week had been. This was their kind of day, mm. um, and you just. And I think it's, you know, you're from Manchester, so you know, like you know, there's a lot of fans that watch Man United and Man City. You know, they're not they're not they're not on great money and they gave all their money on Saturday. That's yeah, their life. Absolutely. Saturday afternoon they yeah. struggle with the kind of, you know, season ticket holders. So when you go there and you think, right, and that, and, and you think, oh, these people are coming to watch me mm. and watch the team. And what you do is make them happy for you know, just a day, but just a couple of weekends or the or the Monday they're going to work. So I had that kind of feeling of like of theatre and thinking, right, I gotta put a show on here. Yeah. yeah. That's what I enjoy doing. And uh, you don't, and you create memories for yourself. But even now, you know, when I've retired, I've got, I wonder, well, nearly thirty years, is it? Yeah, no more than that, no. I'm trying to think, ninety-seven. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you know, 
I still go up because I was there when I when you, when you scored that try. Oh, I did that when you did this, and, and you think, God, oh, it's so nice that people remember what you did like so long ago. So, yeah. and it's that's what you that's what I felt when I was playing on Saturday. Just. Just in, like love in the moment, really. Well, it's a relief, isn't it, from the pressure? I guess that you know people have got very serious yeah. lives in those yeah. situations. They're yeah. struggling to you know put yeah. food on the table, yeah. uh, yeah. etc. And and just for that, you know, couple of hours, it's escapism, isn't it? But it to is. really come together as a community, yeah. and, and I think, do you think that elevated the was the role of rugby elevated because of that economic time? Do you think? I think it's always been kind of there in Wales. You know, having moved then up and realizing it's very similar to Northwest and, and, and South Wales. Mm. And you know, when you look at it, when Bobby Charlton walked in the room, you know, it's like the the order that he had, you know, Kenny Dugleish and or Colin Bell, and even on the cricket inside, you know, you Lancashire and all that, and Yorkshire, like, it's very similar. So I think it's, I don't know if it's elevated because they, it was just when you, when you, kind of go and you represent your country and you understand what it means to people and then if they see that you're giving 100 percent, i think there's a there's a huge respect mm. and i think you know maybe more so back in those days because we were a, bit, a little bit more accessible so it's it was just yeah it was odd you know just uh but i i never envisaged that so i never thought like that because i was late developing i i didn't i never thought of it you know, I never thought of myself as like, you know, now that I'm playing for Wales, that, you know, they look at me like that, you know, sometimes it's just, it's just really, I, I never, I never kind of thought about it like that. Mm, it was, yeah. And I get embarrassed sometimes if, you know, people get a bit, you know, like, oh, starstruck, it's just weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just weird. I'm starstruck. I have Jiffy in our lounge, <laughs> no, so everybody. Right. I was in Chelsea Flower Show and I was starstruck. <laughs> I, I, I was about five years from John Alumni and I was like, John Alumni, John Alumni. It was just mad, isn't it? Was she all ab fab? Oh, yeah, she was. It was just really, you know, just for little things like that because you think, oh, God, you know, it's just watch on telly. And I have, I have that kind of same kind of senses like, any normal person like I am normal yeah yeah it's, it is people are people right isn't it and, yeah. the, and this is what I've learned uh, over my many years um, I'm getting a bit long in the tooth now but also doing the podcast right yeah. because I'm lucky enough to interview you know amazing people CEOs that are running multi-billion yeah, dollar I mean, businesses amazing, and all sorts but fundamentally people, people. are people yeah. and we all have our little gremlins our insecurities yeah. our worries yeah. our doubts we yeah. all mess up at times and you yeah. know and and actually i think if you can relate to people human to human contact right then that's yeah. incredibly powerful and what you've achieved is is phenomenal but but if you think about the lives that you've touched over all those years you know it's it's amazing really um, it is but i think as you said people are people and no matter what industry you're in yeah i think if you get on with people i think you've got a great chance of being successful mm. and most of the sides that i've played with and i've been i've had my happier times there and we've all become like good friends those have been the successful times as well because mm. You know, you know, there's animosity and unrest in, in all types of life and even in sporting teams. Some people don't like each other, you know. And in the same team, maybe playing right next door to each other, but they have the mutual respect for each other and you've got to put it aside. So, but if you, yeah, if you get on with people, I think that's been one of my strengths. I think I've I've always tried to get on with people and I've been, wherever I've gone, I've been a captain or a leader, I suppose, in, in two sports. And it just naturally came to me. To, but the important thing was that person to person level, you have to kind of understand mm. them before you lead them. Yeah. And if you if you understand them, then it's, they're easier to lead, and they'll follow you if they if they respect you as well. Mm. But it, you know, I think it's a lot of it's, it's very very difficult because when I I'm, when I go into business, I don't understand how people in business can't build relationships. Which I found it when I went into business. Well, just like you know, I, I finally did go and meet someone as a tar target, and I met him. I knew then that you know I could build a relationship and straight away and find out what he liked and had some you know what what have we co or common interests. Then we could chat the thing, and all of a sudden, and if he had problems, he'd open up and chat about it. Like you know, even like you said, CEOs of this, FDs of that, because they've all got different pressures mm. and they've all got families as well. So um, yeah, I, I think it's. Yeah, more so everywhere I've been I think I've got on with 
99 percent of all the teams I've been to mm. which I think is I've been I've been very very lucky yeah yeah whether it's me or if it's them yeah absolutely and and I think you know you you talk about the reference between with business mm. and and I think there's a huge amount we can learn from high performance in sports and mm. high performance in business yeah. and, and actually they're not that different really um but with the with with the sort of you know the business people that you deal with today what do you think are the, some of the key takeouts from the world of rugby in particular um, that you can apply to business to help businesses do better? So you mentioned teamwork there. Yeah, been I one think teamwork is huge. All, they all yeah. got to know what they're trying to achieve. That's the first thing. Um, I, it was, it's like, let's get asked this question because it, it is weird because I've never thought, the people ask me, what kind of leader were you? And I went, I don't know. I've never thought about it. Mm. I just felt that I kind of knew what, what was needed to do at that particular time. So I never, I never over, overthought it. And I just reacted instinctively to things. So in business, I, I, th- I think it's, you are going to know what, what your, you know, your, your goal is. Um, also that, um, you know, you have to have a mutual respect for each other. Uh, whether it's the f- receptionist or the cleaner to the CEO, mm-hmm. you know, you're all kind of linked up. Um, what else? It's, but I think it's, it's all about, you know, managing people properly. Mm. Um, so I think it caught me now a little bit. Um, I think the, I think the point you just mentioned though was around around kind of understand. Like it's almost like a common purpose, right? Because because if you're playing yeah. for a, in a team sport, you're trying to win the game, right? You're trying yeah. to win win the tournament, whatever yeah. it might be. So it's very clear what you're trying to achieve. And I think sometimes in, in business, it can get confused about the reason why, yeah. the reason why people are there. And, yeah. and that's what I see quite a bit. Whereas if you've got that real clarity of purpose and drive and what you're all aiming for, then you've got to be yeah, much easier to get I, there, yeah, right? I think so. And, and it's, it's just odd. It's, they make a lot of it. Mm. And... You know, I've never been into a huge company. I've worked with people who are, you know, I've worked with HSBC, I've worked with Guinness, BT, Heineken. They're pretty big brands. They're big <laughs> brands, they are, you know. And, and, and you know, meet the top people, I didn't do some more, but I just keep it simple. I think the simpler it is, the more people understand it, then the easier, the easier the goal. And I think it is getting kind of, a personal level where everyone, everyone gets, you know, has a, has a voice. Um, I just think that preparation is is key. Mm. Um, communication that's that's massive. You know, even in, in the sporting industry, because when you when you like in front of sixty thousand people, you can't hear anything. So you, the communication pre-game okay, is yeah. just as important as on the game. Because you know, if I'm if we're talking against and there's eighty thousand people, I can't hear you. So you what you should know what's go what's going to be you know happening next. So I think that that's for me that was a lot of it. Um, yeah, it's you have the team building things, and it's just I've never overthought things. Mm. I think that's what it is, and they are you know people going from sport to business. I listen to a lot of people, and I think oh you know just a lot of it's common sense. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of it is common sense, and there's it's just you know I've, I've been. Very, very lucky that I've had good people around me, and I've always surrounded myself with keep good people. I've always, and also I've, I've always surrounded myself with people that would challenge me. Mm. So I don't say if I say something and they say, "Oh yes," well, no, I don't want that. I want to know what you think. Don't yeah. just say yes because you think I'm just have a have an opinion. Yeah, and then we'll discuss it all, and we see if my opinion is right. Well, okay, we'll go with it. If not, well, we might have to tinker with it. Mm. So I've never, never been scared of change. Um, obviously, with different career paths yeah but I just think it's a, a lot for me it's the main thing as you mentioned is people mm. I think that's the key thing for me yeah how you manage people yeah and you know in terms of in terms of leadership so can you think of a time where it was you had the most difficult time leading the team either because of the situation or who you were playing against or a backdrop of events that have been leading up to a scenario and yet you you as the leader yeah. You still, how do you motivate a team when you feel like your chances of winning are probably yeah. quite slim? Yeah. There's, there's different know? people. That sometimes they have good motivators. Mm. And they can, if you can drill self-belief into a side, right, you never know what's going to happen. And if you prep properly, you know, tactically, how to beat someone, and then the belief that comes from this leader 
in, you know that's instilled in you. Then all of a sudden you can read your game by a certain level. Um, I've, I've had a couple of examples where you know I'm in I'm in New Zealand and we've lost the first test by fifty points, and you have just got to try and motivate the side. And it's not a motive. Then it's a, you know you kind of knew that you weren't going to win. And it's a difficult situation being a sportsman when you think that that side is so much better than you. Yeah. You're like you know you're like going as fodder. But just to say, right, okay, forget the result. Let's just do what's best for. And I, on, on, on that tour, I just try to outplay my opposite number all the time. Mm. Although we wouldn't win the game, I know that I was better than my opposite player. So that was difficult. More than the side that had been away for six weeks, that had been battered, you know, physically and emotionally, been uh, run down in the press um, in New Zealand. And all of a sudden, they all want to go home. Say, look, I'm just trying to get them to play one more game before we go on. Over. And that's all about pride in your performance, you know, respect of each other. You're going to give 100%. And that's that's a difficult situation. Um, I remember being in uh, Australia playing for a rugby league team and um, we had a lot of injuries and we had to win a couple of games to get to the semifinals to all the playoffs. And the, I remember coming in and the coach telling me one day, right, OK, he looked around. And you want to get, like... Cases, slabs of beer, right? And he said, look, upon this training, we're all, most of us are broken. So we're all sitting here, we all drink this now, all together, we all gel. Those who need physio tomorrow, go to physio. You know, those who can train, can train. We meet on Thursday, so he gave us a week off. We meet on mm-hmm. Thursday, we all came, and we all came new ready that he'd, he'd done that to us. He said, right, come back, I want you to do what you do best, but when you come on Thursday... You're already, and then we won on a Saturday, you know. So mm. there's all different ways of motivation, um, insights. Um, but again, it's, it just does come down to prep and understanding what everyone else needs. Like, I give an example that this prop forward I played with didn't know we needed to turn a scrum and tackling along this way, but he'd have to take a spec backward step, and he didn't understand if he took a backward step, we'd, we'd attack the right that side and be beneficial for the team. So I said, Look, unless you understand you're not playing mm. so I said you're not going to pick you and you're the better player but you've got to understand what, what the, the team goal is not your what your individual individual goal is so there's a lot of examples like that all the time um, you know and when you're when you are playing as well when you're in a position like I, I, as a goal kicker you know the pressure's on either to win or lose a game and then you're a hero or you know zero but you just go back to basics you breathe and you're the one who's been practicing like throughout your career to do it. And I, because when you're in training, everyone's up to taking goals so again in the way. <laughs> and then when it's a kick to win the match, there's no one to be seen. So it's so there's so many elements of it that are, are different. And and again, you just come back to the scenario of it, right? What's the right thing to do at the right time? Mm. And then hopefully with your experience and the people around you, you can get that right. Obviously, you can't you don't get it right all the time. But that's what that's what happens most of the time, and and sport is, as you said, it's like week in week out. You know, you're judged every every Saturday or Sunday or Friday. So mm. it is it is tough sometimes. You know, when you get on a, a losing run, it can become a habit, and you try and break things up and do things differently. Um, some coaches will flog you more, flog you more, flog you more. And I didn't think that was any good. And when you get into a winning habit, you know you can relax a little bit and do what you want mm. because you're winning on a Saturday. Yeah, and it's, and it's what you know what you do different or what did you do to get in that that position? And usually, like you know, it's the, it's the players around you that perform, and the better the player, the better the side you are. So, you mm. know, what, what makes a good what makes a good manager? Good players. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, well, that's it. We're only we're only ever one individual, aren't yeah. we? With twenty four hours yeah. in a day, and and yeah. it is absolutely about the people and if you around get the you. The best out of that person, you know, it, mm. it doesn't matter. If you, there's all different levels and different salaries and different sports to kind of people. But as a manager and as a person, if you can get the best out of that person, and maybe you think he's not as good as the other one as plays it opposite him, but on that day, he can raise his game and you can get the best out of him. Maybe for that day, he could be better than the one he's playing against. Mm. And that's all you've got to do. If you can get, I think the best coaches and managers I've ever had is that they get the best out of every player. And that's all, and that's all you can ask for. Mm. So when you're looking at building a team and selecting, yeah. um, are you looking for, well, I know you, the answer will be both uh, before I even get, but yeah. are you looking for skill? Are you looking for attitude? Because you could have a really skillful player that's just the attitude's yeah. not quite right. And the same in business as well, yeah. right? 
It's a tricky one. Yeah, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. <laughs> but I, I remember listening to some lady on the, on the podcast, and she said, I'd, "I'd rather in your business, I'd rather I'd rather have a hole than a nasso." <laughs> that, that's so true, right? Yeah, you yeah, think? Okay. yeah. And I think I, I think first and foremost, the bloke's attitude has got to be inclusive. He is he's with us or he's not. If he's not with us, that's going to be an issue for me. Mm. Because I'm playing my heart out and I'm getting battered and I want and I'm giving everything and if and if I see him not doing the same, I, I would have an issue with it. Yeah. Um and then I think if you've got that attitude and you fit in and you work hard, some there are players who, who over and above the team then are expected to do that little bit of magic and then maybe that's why you know they're on maybe more money or maybe that's why they were bored. So but first and foremost, you've got it the team, the team and the team ethic comes first for me. And then after that, if if everyone's different, if they can offer something different over and above that. But ultimately for me, it has to be we, we all buy into the same thing. Mm, yeah, fantastic. So when you moved, did May, you were making the big decision to move from Union to League. Had that been coming for quite a long time, the lead up, the, you know, the lead up to that decision, and because it's a big one, right? You've you've yeah. you've played for however many years yeah. as union. Yeah. You've got all this pressure. You've got this economic backdrop. You've got family commitments. All this going on, a lot of pressure. Also, yeah, I guess a lot of. Um, you know, the scouts from yeah. rugby league coming and telling you how amazing you are and we want you. And, you know, it, 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 there's a lot happening at that time for you, presumably. Yeah. Was it a difficult decision? Um, a mass, uh, unless you've gone through it. Because most people change change jobs and they change, in, but they're still in the same job, but from a different company. Yeah. Well, I was changing from, from, a, from one sport to a different sport, a different part of the country. And I'd never played sport before. So, um and I, and I knew once I went, I'd be a massive target. So I'd have to, you know, put up with the physical uh, and the verbal abuse mm. on the field and off, you know, from the crowds and everything. I don't know, it, it kind of built up somehow because, uh, you know, wheels weren't going well. I was getting blamed sometimes and the new coach came in and sort of change it. Because I think if we, if we'd have, if that, if we'd have kept the same coaches and the players from, the New Zealand tour, we'd have been a good side for the 91 World Cup. So mm. that might have been different then if we'd have kept everything normal. But, you know, if, if you if if you have disastrous results, you know, there's usually heads will roll. And sure. I think if you look at that tour, and there were reasons why they were so much better because they were professional and we were amateur. So, you know, they, but it wasn't a level no, playing field, no, was it? Wasn't. <laughs> so all this was building up. I'd spoken to a couple of rugby league people before because I played well in Australia in the Sevens tournament. So there was interest. And then, but I love playing for Clenethley and I love playing for Wales. And I was happy and I was captain. But there was something nagging away at me that things weren't right and the, the right people weren't in charge of the Welsh team. And so I kind of like, like not disillusioned with them. I, but then they might they were also you know that you might lose your place and I I didn't care about that. But then you know the rugby league boys and Dougie Lawton was a great salesman. He came down mm. and I, I don't think I had no intention of actually signing. And then he did a sales job on me. So he knew me. He he was he t- talked to me on a personal level and said, "Oh, you're the last piece of the jigsaw. You're a great player. You're this, that, and everything. I look after you." And then. So that meant a lot to me that he had faith in me yeah. and that he would look after me because he was signing me so I would be his kind of his baby, so to speak. And But even he said, if you know, if he'd have known the, <laughs> the, the storm that happened when I went, maybe he wouldn't have bought me. But and I think that was it. And then the money was coming from my background. Security was yeah. important to me. Um, and I tore my cruciates ligaments like um, when I was 19 or 20 when I started with Nice. So how long did I have left in my career? I wouldn't know. So it was just a lot of things kind of fitted in together. And, I, and, it, and again, it was just, if you ask other players, or you know, maybe it's the right thing or wrong thing. For me, it was the right thing at the time to do for me and mm. for my family. Uh, maybe not for my mum, you know, because I'd leave it on my sister and all that. But I thought, mm. look, ultimately, I could look after myself and look after my family. And I and I 
great belief in my own ability and I and I knew it was tougher than what people thought I was. I didn't have to show all that. So it was massive. It was really, really massive. And I, you know, I still have regret of maybe not playing for the British Lions rugby union, but you have to, you, you have to make tough decisions in life. And I'd made tough decisions on the back of my dad passing on my own anyway. Yeah. So I wasn't scared of making big decisions. And I analyzed it. Look, if I, if I make it, it'll be good for me. The risk is if I don't make it, that's the end of me. You'll never hear of me again, I suppose. You know, I'll be working somewhere, I'll coming back. I can't be rugby union again. So it's a massive decision. And um, but I thought, look, you know, I've got to do it. Yeah. Just felt that at the time, look, and I that night they did the deal, but I didn't sign the night they spoke to me because they said, Oh, we need to go back and the committee gotta verify the, the amount of money and the and the contract. And I said, and I just went, Look, you come up with the contract that we've discussed, I'll shake hands tomorrow. He rang me at midnight, said, deal is done, see you tomorrow. I came in and I signed. And that was it. How did you feel when you signed in that moment? Was it an excitement or was it in, in the pit of your stomach? What was your gut telling you at that point? It was unknown. I, I didn't know how to feel because I didn't know what, what was going to happen next. And I think that's another key thing. You know, if you if you know what's going to happen next and you plan for it, then all of a sudden it's an easier step. But if you go into the unknown and, the, and then the, the, all you're thinking goes haywire. And I didn't know, you know, I didn't I'd actually know what to do. I, I was thinking, I said, what have I done? And when I went up there and I was like targeted, that was the first couple of months, it was like really tough. I was spat on and, you know, I was like all oh, everywhere I went, there's like all phlegm all over me oh and verbally God. abused and like, you know, and everything. So, so I was thinking, just... this is sport. And I'm thinking, oh, I know they're going, oh, you're getting paid for it now. I don't know the sense of real, but I never thought that differently when I played league or union. Right. I thought I wanted the best of my ability for me. I don't care if I'm getting paid for it or not. Mm. I want to show people how good I am and I want to, I want to enjoy it and win things. So they, being a professional, that didn't put any pressure on me whatsoever. People say, oh, you're a world right, good uh, signing. What pressure is that? I don't, I don't get any pressure. Mm. Didn't feel any pressure like that. The pressure's on myself to play, to, for me to know, to show people how good I was. And this would give me the opportunity, maybe not in the glare that I wanted, to do that. So it was it was all different pressures. The handling pressure is different, and that people handle them handles uh, people handle pressure differently. It was a off the field pressure. There's an on the field pressure. I had to secure, make sure that my family were fine first of all. That they're happy. That a doctor, you know, dentist, schools, DIY man, all of this, so that if I I I've got to focus on what I'm doing because mm. if I'm focusing and I'm doing well, everyone's happy. If I'm not doing well, or I'm, things are happening in the house and I can't fix, and there's no washing machine, and my wife's going nuts. It, all of that, all of that. So I had to put that in place first of all. Then I put the then I put the and I could focus on my rugby. But then I still worked. I still got a part time job up there. I oh, worked, did you? I worked, yeah, I worked three days a week as a salesman. So in the day I worked and and sold pre coated chip ins for one company. And I and I was a industrial fabrication for another company. So I still worked when I was a rugby league player as well. It's all glamour, isn't it? Oh, it's very, very glamorous. Very glamorous. <laughs> it's, it's all glamour up north. But you keep it real. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I still have the glamour then, you know, it opened it opened up to me because you know I'd go and sleep watch I used to go watch my night the Liverpool Everton. Yeah. I played golf with people like Brian Robson, who was my hero, like, you know, yeah. and I mean, Kenny Dugleish, as I mentioned before. So it was like coming from, and I also, it was, as it made me, it, it opened my eyes to the world because living in Wales and living in a small community, you know, you, you've kind of blinkered. Mm. So when you move to Manchester and Liverpool and, you, and, you, and you're playing against Leeds, all of a sudden there's, you know, it opens up what the real world is all about. So I, it, 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 it made me a, a better person, I suppose, or more, yeah, I think I was a better person. And then when I finished and understanding the UK mentality, not the Welsh mentality, so it helped in my broadcasting and mm. helped in whatever I went to speeches and everything. So it was like, it was more than a money move. I think it opened my eyes to, you know, a, a, a bigger world, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And you, you talked about the public speaking and all mm. the stuff that you're doing now. Do you think your career in media today was has been helped by the fact you had to deal with the media on the other side of the of the kind of <laughs> table, if you like, for so yeah. many years. Yeah. Has, has that been useful uh, for you? Yeah, but I, but I think I acknowledge that at the start. Because of the person I am, I was always open to interview. I realised that as a guy 
right, there's a guy who worked for the Warrington Guardian and there's a guy who worked for the Witness Weekly, right? And they were like stood outside in the rain. And I knew they had, they had column inches to write, okay? So for me to come out, I'd done my job. They'd watched it. They'd, they'd taken time to come. So I, I, I would say, right, I, it's my duty to, to talk to them. Mm, okay. So I would talk to them. It is, if we were, lo- we're not lost, I'd be honest and go, look, we're crap today. Didn't deserve to win. Things, we have to look up to. The, and then they'd write there and go, oh, thanks, Jeff, for the couple of And those two people, two, it's amazing because those people that I kind of, when I was playing, they've, got, they've gone into the media I know they're in high positions in the media and I've had a relationship with them for the last 30 odd years. Mm. And I, I think they respected me for doing those things and I respect them for the way they've come up and where they started. So, because, you know, they're like normal boys like me. So, um, and I had to then, to, to sit there and understand what they had to do. And then I do television and radio interviews. Yes, it's not, because when you, when you see these players on, come on television, they're starstruck because they're not used to it. I, I kind of, I didn't know that I, I, at the time that I was going to go to television, but I wanted to absorb everything that was there at the time. And I, and, and I felt it was my responsibility to say things that to the press because the press would um, kind of um, report on it, which would make the game bigger. Mm. So it was. I think we were all in it together to make the sport a better sport and more and more accessible to people. Yeah. So I've always I've, I've always been fair to people, and you know, and, and I've, I've always been open to you know speaking in the press all the time. Mm. And you appeared on Wogan, of course. <laughs> How was that? Was that surreal? Yeah, no, it's mad. It's mad. <laughs> yeah, it's just. Yeah, it's. You you have to. I think when you come from there, and you're thrown into it. It's just. It, it does take a lot of getting used to, and I mm. did go off the rails a little bit. Um, but the excitement of it, like you just, you don't know, you're caught in a wave and you just got to go with the wave and um, you just got to be very careful. And that's when it's important that you do surround yourself with good people. So like I said, I had Brian Thomas and John Evington and Neil Fairbrother who understood me in the union game. Uh, I had good friends around me, good circle of friends. When I went to rugby league, then I had, um, you know, Dougie Lawton looking after me. Uh, I, lo- I spoke to a lot of the senior players there, you know, because there was a lot of jealousy there because I was coming in as a world record fee yeah. uh, with, with the eldest bloke. So I I tried to gain their confidence, gain their respect, one as a person and two, you know, as a rugby player. So, I, you know, I learned a lot of them. And then when I went into the broadcasting then, I, um, you know, I, I, I got hold of um, a couple of people, John Morgan, who, who, who helped me to do the television, how to conduct myself how to sit what to dress and then what to say and then Peter Corrigan was a journalist for the Observer so I, and I'd, I'd ring him up after every television and say well, what was I like he said oh you're bloody hopeless today are you slim in your chair for what do you say to be honest for are you lying to us I'm like oh, okay cheers Peter thanks for that <laughs> so I you know and yeah. I, they knew I wouldn't take offence to it so yeah. and then, but, on, but then you have to when you go into you know into Wogan and all of a sudden Everyone knows you because light entertainment mm. is massive. So I can understand how people like Beckham, you know, all these people, especially Beckham is massive, you know, Gareth mm. Bale, um, you know, even the John, John and Ross and Pierce. I know how they, how they cope with all the stars because they, they can't have their own lives at all. And I, you know, I have a huge respect for them for like being who they are, I suppose. Mm. But you just adapt to it. You do adapt to it. And you've got to just keep... If you lose track of who you are, you're in big trouble. And you, if you, Sometimes that's very difficult to control. You need people to go, what are you doing? Yeah, call you out. <laughs> you know, straight away. I've always thrown myself to go, what are you doing, Jay? What? You, what? And you think you have a sense of reality and go, and I, you know, I've had the bad press and, you know, for off, off the field things that I've done, I've regretted. But it's part of life and you've got to learn from them, I suppose. Mm. Have there been times when you think your ego has taken over, when, when, when you know, you're at your sort of peak and you're getting all of the accolades and you've been invited on to Wogan and it's all becoming yeah. this, you know, wow, it becomes no. a big show, right? It is difficult to say no, I think. Yeah. And then it all happens and it all comes tumbling down, really. Mm. And I, know it's a, I went to Zimbabwe I went to Hong Kong I played in Senate in Australia and I come back and I pull a hamstring and I miss up playing for the Lions in, at Cardiff you know so and then you think oh, what are you doing you gotta you can't do it all you know because that's the thing you, you never get it you know I never I didn't I didn't go abroad till I was 18 uh, I went to school when I was 15 Trento, but I didn't go on a family holiday abroad till I was 18 you know so I'd never experienced the finer things in life you know I'd never been to good restaurants never been to London 
you know, and I was like starstruck a little bit. And it does, mm. it just, you, it, it, it does, it can really, you know, you can get caught up in it and you get turned on, you could be spacked out on the other end, to be honest, and that's the end of you. Yeah. And I do realize, you know, the reality stars now, like, like when they get out, when they get flipped off on the other side, how they have mental, mental health issues, you know, and it's, it is difficult, but again, you just got to make sure that you've got good people around you, I think. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I mean, that's the theme, isn't it, really? All um, the time, yeah, it's odd. It's odd that I... And I just think you take tip, little tidbits of everyone that, that, you know, whatever you've been and people you listen to and all I've said and who's nice and who's not nice and you, and you understand straight away. You, like, I'm very I'm very good at picking out who's, you know, the, who's not good for me, you know. Mm. I'd be very lucky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you do, you need someone to call out your bullshit, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. honestly, sometimes I'll like, you know, when I've done various roles and jobs and stuff and I'll go back home and I'm just mm-hmm. like, Jeanette, like the, you know, the youngest of three and don't, don't, don't think you're anything fancy around these parts. You, you must know? sit, you must sit, you know, when you're in the boardroom and you, you must sit there thinking, okay, what's, what are these people talking about? What's that bloke talking about? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> are, are you in a position then to say, you know, are you confident enough to go, what, 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 you, what, are you, what are you saying that to? I, I would say I got confident, but when I was okay. earlier in my career, yeah. I found it quite difficult because, yeah. and, 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 it, and it was a different era, you know, it was when I was, I'd often be the only woman in the boardroom with a yeah. P&L, yeah. Yeah. right? Normally you'd have HR or be female yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. But, and, and you know, I, yeah, it was quite tough. Um, but I think over the years, I ju- I always had to work. I just had to work on it. I used to think, well, all you can do is your best. And there were a couple of pivotal moments in my career where I knew that the this, the group CEO was making a was going about to make the wrong decision. And I had a couple of times I had to think, do I just go with this because that's probably what ninety five ninety nine percent of people yeah. would do. Yeah. Or do I say, no, I don't think that's right? And I chose the, no, I don't think that's right, um, route. But let me tell you why. Yeah, that's the route. And if it's up to yeah. them then. And actually, it changed the decision. Yeah, well, that's, because that's up to of them, that. isn't it? If, if, you've, if you've given your input, yeah. then you've done your job. Yeah. And if he takes it or doesn't take it, now that's on his head. He yeah. had, and if he, if he just goes, oh, no, and then it doesn't work, then he knows he's made the wrong decision. But yeah. that's ultimately, you know, I think you're... Yeah. You've got to sleep at night, And that's right? an environment where, you know, I always try to aspire to with with my team. Mm, yeah. Everyone had a voice. Yeah, it's so important. And you've got to create that environment of psychological safety, haven't yeah. you? You know, so yeah. that people can disagree or say, oh, I think we should look yeah. at it differently. Yeah. Or, oh, I don't like the way you, maybe you spoke to me then. Actually, that's not appreciated. No, that's, and that's no, and more so, no. And yeah. I, got, I got four daughters and, you know, I, it is difficult in... The current, the current kind of society where you, what is and, and what's wrong? Because I, I kind of knew what was right and what's wrong in my day, and I still, I still think that applies now. Mm, mm, mm. So not much has changed because people's attitudes and the and there's a lack of perspective. You got and you've got to understand older people are different. Yeah. So if you want them to understand you, you've got to understand them as well. So it's all, all the things that are going on now. I, I am absolutely gobsmacked with a lot of things that I see, mm, mm. you know, and respect and all this, for, you know, for the lack of respect for teachers, lack of respect for policemen, um, lack of respect for the elderly, lack of respect for society in general. Yeah. I still think, you know, what was wrong, what was right and wrong in my day is still the same now. So... But people are making excuses of it all the time. Yeah, and good, you know, good manners don't cost anything. anything you know, exactly. be a good person, right? No. I, I think, you know, that's... That's in all walks of life. Mm. So, you know, it's, um, it's, and if you, yeah, it's odd because you can't be afraid to say something, no matter who you are. No, I and agree. And if, if I'm seeing someone getting, getting abused or saying the wrong thing, I'm like, well, hang on a minute. I've always been a cheapy choppy kind of thing. And now I'm thinking, of it, oh, I have to check what I've got to say sometimes. And I know I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, you know, I'm not homophobic. And you're thinking, God almighty, what people, if I say one small thing, it's all, the world comes tumbling down, you know? I know. Has it gone too far? A little to, bit. To, to yeah, the, you know, but to everyone's got to have perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. So when you actually finished up playing professional rugby, yeah. 
again, did that, was that just a natural, a natural time for you to go or was there a light bulb moment, a catalyst that's where you said, right, okay, now, now I need to, to move, move on with my next phase of my professional life. Yeah. During my career, I've always, I don't know if it's kind of planned it, but it's always seemed to, I've always thought a couple of steps ahead. When I was mm. playing, I'd, I'd think a couple of steps ahead and it would, it would hopefully work out. Um, and then when I, again, when you finished playing, it was different. It was circumstances that um, helped me in one way. Um, my, I find my wife got diagnosed with, with cancer. So if, I'd have, if, if rugby league would have offered me a job, I'd have stayed up there, I think. Yeah. But then when rugby union went professional, there's another avenue for me and I could come home. So I'd have a bit better support system around me. Yeah. And because I'd done rugby league and rugby union, and both games were professional, and there was a lot of influ influence from rugby league defensive coaches, rugby union, I thought oh, it might be an opportunity here. And because I'd, I'd understood the other side of the camera, because I'd, I'd witnessed a lot of it, mm -hmm. I, was, I wasn't nervous about it. I was confident that I could do it. But then it's, it's like anything else. You need a little bit of luck. And I'd done a lot of question of sport. It was a great program then. And Ray Stubbs, who's now a broadcaster, mm. he used to be the one of the mystery guests, right? Yes. So say <laughs> someone dropped out. I used to watch that with my dad. Yeah, there we are. So say <laughs> someone dropped out, mystery guest, you go, ah, oh, Jeff, someone's dropped out. Come in. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so anyway, so they'd show all the faces, but most of the hands, right, and the back of the shot, it'd be Ray anyway. So Ray was in most of the, I'm you know, the mystery guest, right, <laughs> except for the reveal at the end. Even though I, I had a skin full one Sunday, and he said, oh, will you help me on a Monday morning? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Cleaning the elephant poo out from the Chester Zoo, right? I was... <laughs> I was being sick all the time. So I oh. so built a relationship with Ray. He's, Ray's a great guy and I respected his broadcasting skills. And he was still involved. So I said, look, I'm really interested. So he went and asked Brian Barwick, two scousers. He said, I'll give you a chance. And all of a sudden I'm in. Mm. But then there's a different pressure then because when you know you're still friendly with the players that are playing, so you can't like slag them off too much. And you've got to explain to people what's happening and you've got to, I, I still think as a player, so I, I could analyse it quickly. And then the, the difficult thing was explaining or getting it over to the general public. So that's, I kind of fit it in quickly. And um, it just, luckily, three months, and I had a contract and I could build it and work on it. So it wasn't planned, but, and I, I never thought of going into television. But because the game, two games were kind of getting closer and being professional, like back in Cardiff, I had contacts in, in, in the industry. It just kind of happened. Mm. And I worked, again, people think, oh, you know, with rugby, oh, you must have been natural. Yeah, you work at it. You know, you work, you work at everything. You know, you work hard at something. And then hopefully, if you're naturally gifted at something, that'll come up over that. And it's the same thing in, in television. I did the same. I worked so hard. I watched a lot of things. I watched a lot of other commentators and co-commentators and it's simple the commentator is the main guy on the game he says what's happening and my role is to explain why it's happening okay if I, yeah. the simpler i make it so people can understand it the easier it is and rugby is a very complicated game anyway and that's why soccer is the best the biggest game in the world because it's simple apart from offside and over <laughs> but it's that's what it, and so I, I kind of went into it and then once i had the opportunity i thought right i gotta I'm going to do this. I'm going to nail this. And because I could do rugby union and rugby league, all of a sudden my weekends were taken up and I was working two sports. Two, I'd, on, I'd work two games. I'd, sometimes I'd work rugby union first and rugby league on the same afternoon. So my brain <laughs> would have to really switch over quickly. Yeah. But even then I'd say a couple of wrong terminology and I'd get picked up straight away with people. So it's, you know, it, yeah. when you're out there and you're in the public, you're always a target, but you've got to accept it, I suppose. And, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Skin, but, I, yeah. I had a great mentor that said to me when I start when I came out of corporate and I started doing more social media stuff, and I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm not massive on social media, but I've built it up um a little bit over the years. And then doing the podcast, Rob Moore said to me, People are gonna judge you anyway. Right? They're gonna judge you anyway, because that's yeah. human nature. Yeah. So but you've got a lot of value to, to add. So put yourself out in the world in a way yeah. that's congruent with your values. Yeah. And if you're, you're, you're doing it with the best intention, you're not harming anyone yeah. or, you know, we might yeah. not always get it right. 
But do it because otherwise you're keeping that to yourself yeah. and that would be a great shame actually yeah. when you can yeah. really, and, you know, and yeah. I think as you were talking about how do you explain it in layman's terms, you've gone full circle really because where you where you started out with your family, you know, with your family background and, and where you come yeah. from, yeah. that's now your one of your super skills to be able to relate to the person who's listening that doesn't understand the complexity. Yeah. And, 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 and when you go, when you say, oh, how does that lead to business? Until you're in that environment with the business, right? I couldn't tell them what I, what, I, what, what, what they should do because mm. it's always come that an instinctive to me to do things at certain times. So it is. And, and that's the thing. I just feel that um, you've just got to be yourself. And I think it, the more you develop, the more confident you get. And, you know, I, I, I could walk into any room now, right? And I wouldn't care who's there. You know, just I would feel confident because I think, oh, then my bet, I've done okay, you know, people are happy, you know. But, and you're right, people, people will make a decision, judgment on you like, and they've never met you. And I always have this, oh, I was so-and-so like, oh, what about the Eddie Butler? Eddie Butler was a brilliant bloke. But people, because he had a, a really posh accent, he was intelligent, people took an instant dislike to him. Mm. And I say, you haven't met him. He's one of the best blokes you ever come across in your life. Will Carlin's another one. It was, oh, I well, well shaped him. He's funny. He's just a really personable guy, you know. And I tell you, you, you know, people say, oh, yeah, I don't like, you know, I never liked you. Yeah, come on, you go, I never liked you. So how do you know that? I never met me. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, yeah. Sometimes you're in in a position where people love you, so it's easy. But then you're totally opposite. We're going to go into a room where people hate you, mm. and you're going to kind of win them over. And you're, why do you, why have I got to win you over? You know, yeah. Just be myself. Exactly. If I'm not your bag, that's fine. Uh, and that's fine. Yeah. I know what you about it. You know, you know. If if that's the case, I'm not going to have a couple of punches and have a chat with you every week. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's, it's all and people worry about things like that. Yeah. yeah and as yeah. you get older, I'm like, oh, I'm going like that. Now. I'm going, I spend time with people I want to spend time with. Yeah. And I'm lucky I'm in that situation. I think it's dangerous. It holds people back, doesn't it? You know, I always think, you know, if you're worrying about what people will think, what people will say, I mean, it's not that you don't care no. and, you, and you do anything to to, to no. be disrespectful or anything, no. but actually that can just hold you back completely, yeah. can't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I get people on social media writing in now and going, complaining to the BBC, right, that I don't know what I'm doing and, um, you know, you should, I should get sacked. No. Yeah. So I'm, if I reply to them, right, I get into trouble. So if I I don't if I looked up there, what do they do now then? Well, I don't know what he does. You know, he's a lawyer or he's a, you know he's a bus driver, scaffolder, whatever. I'm like, oh, okay. So if I if I went and emailed back to you and say this bloke's abused me, can you get him sacked? I never <laughs> think of affecting someone's life like that, you know. But then they think because you're in the public eye, fair game. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got yeah. a few scrapes I got as well. Right. <laughs> and my mates on BBC's got, okay, read them, Jeff. Okay, fine, okay. <laughs> so, so, so talk about the BBC, because before we yeah. press record, we were saying how, you know, you've done a vast majority of, of your media work and, and your your um, uh, TV work has been yeah. with the BBC, yeah. right? Um, which is a, an institution in its own yeah. right. Yeah. And and that comes with perception, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and obviously you've had a great experience with the BBC. Yeah, they've been uh, brilliant to me, yeah. Yeah, so... But in terms of sort of some of the more newer media channels, shall we say, um, yeah. you know, are there blockers for you there? Um, do you think that's something I, you might want to get into in a bit more of a sort I, of proactive I would, way? I would love to work for, I've never done a World Cup, okay? Because I was um, kind of, I would work, I'm governed by rights. So BBC would go on, BBC, I love the BBC, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Um, people are, are they're brilliant. The ones I've 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 worked with, I've been very lucky to work with amazing people in front of the camera, behind the camera. They, they they've been good people and very very talented people. I've learned a lot from. I've been privileged, you know, to enjoy it. So, but on the now that things are changing, you know, it's you just got to accept what it is. I would ITV have got. A World Cup, never worked in a World Cup on ITV um, as a commentator. You know, I'd love to do that, but I can understand maybe I'm institutionalised. They see me as a BBC man, that's the end of it. But we had a bigger piece of the cake in those days, and now there's more broadcasters coming in, mm. so and they want to make more money from it. So you've got, you know, 
uh, the European game, which is on one, broad, one broadcaster. You've got the Six Nations, one broadcaster. I, and then you've got the World Cup, then you've got different leagues everywhere. Mm. So, you know, and I, diversity is coming in and they want to give other people opportunities. And maybe I am, maybe, you know, the wrong age and uh, I'm being BBC seen. But uh, it's, I still feel that the, the best people should have the job. 100%. And also, no, I did, I know, I, I learned my trade. I did 39 radio shows. Um, I did the lower leagues. And now people are being thrust into positions where I feel sorry for them because. It's brutal. If you're thrust in and you're unprepared, that could be the end of you. Mm. So a lot of the agents are pushing people in where maybe they're not ready for it. So they should say, look, you've got to, because people know they want instant success. They're not prepared to wait. This is there, you know. It's like when you want to watch something on television or anything else, television, like, oh, okay, it's iPlayer, it's, you know, it's in Instagram, it's yeah. TikTok, whatever. So you can see straight away. But you have to, you have to deserve to be there. I think sometimes, and it is what it is at the moment. I've I've enjoyed. I've, I've I think it's twenty seven years I've been with the BBC now. Wow. I've been very lucky with S Four C as well. I've done twenty years as a um, got a television chat show with Nigel Owens and Sarah and Alex Jones started running a Larry show, and so I've been very lucky to do that. So that's been you know interviewing techniques. I've been very lucky then because I can speak Welsh and I've done few World Cups and Six Nations and European matches with S4C. So, mm. but yeah, I, I think maybe would I want to do a lot more on a weekend? Maybe not. Um, but I would, you know, it, it'd be nice maybe to have the opportunity to do some of, the, some of the big games and maybe World Cup. But I've done it with Radio 5. I've been lucky to do it with Radio 5. So I've been very fortunate. But I do think, you know, things, a lot, a lot of things have changed now. So I'll have to wait and see maybe go off and do something else. Mm, well, Who ITV, knows? when you're listening to this, yeah, I mean, um, it's going to happen. Yeah, it's we'll going to happen. We'll but, you know, you, you're you're absolutely right. But, you know, you've got a lot a lot of tools in your toolkit, yeah. shall we say. Yeah. And um, <laughs> just because you've been in, in the BBC for so long doesn't mean to say that you can't add value to another media channel no, at no, all, no, does no. it? And also, yeah. with all the experiences, they talk about kind of empathy, they talk about transition, collaboration, uh, change, uh, resilience and all these are big buzzwords and then I'm mm. thinking yeah you know I've been through them in personal life and sporting life right? yeah. and in and in the public eye but it's it's odd how can you relate that back to business because I'm thinking I would lo- I'd love to go into keynote speaking but I would like to be in so if I mean you go somewhere go right mm. interview me and then I can bring it all out I don't want to be talking to people on I, this is my story. Mm. If I affect someone in the audience by my story, well, that's, that's fine. You know, you've got aspirations of being where I am today. Well, mm. you can be because I was where we you were at the start of my career. Mm. So it's all of that. I wouldn't mind giving some of my experiences back. Um, so it's it's just odd where I am, what, what I want to do. Maybe a bit of mentoring with the young players, but unless you've got these badges and the academy managers are a bit, you know, threatened if someone like me comes in I don't know because I'm quite outspoken but it is I've, I've enjoyed life and I've not, I, you know, I just I, I've always spoken my mind um, but you know it's just a way you, again you, you come back to what you want to do and what's what's good in life and what's the next step for me, I suppose. Yeah, Who knows? yeah. Well, I think there are no limits. And you've you've made all these amazing things happen in your life and career yes, before. So, so you know, why not? I why mean, why not you? But I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy being yeah. out there. You know, I enjoy talking to, you know, people like yourselves. I enjoy talking to different kind of um, sectors. And it's, it's just, it makes the world go round in a way because mm. if you're just into sport, you get bored sometimes. And that's well, why you've always worked. Yeah, and it's so relatable. That's the thing, yeah. you know. And and you know, I can tell you now from my with my corporate hat on, yeah. um, you would add huge value to an organisation. Yeah. Um, you know, absolutely. So so I think it's just a case of the the how. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, I, and think the, the I think it is. I think it's timing. I think it's yeah. Who knows what'll happen? Well, I think the best is yet to come. Now, before <coughs> before we finish, because I'm I know we're going to talk for you hours. I know, I know. You can talk as much as me. I know. <laughs> Probably more, actually. Maybe, maybe. Um, so you obviously got your MBE, yeah, and you got your OBE, yeah. Okay, so so and they were what? More than ten years apart? 
roughly? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, something like that. But, you know, that, don't, you don't set up in life to get them, do you? I know, you know but that I mean? must have been bonkers. I mean, how? what a great, two great accolades. Not one. You're greedy, aren't you? You couldn't have well, one. You had to have yeah, two. Yeah, there's one in sport. <laughs> so the other one is for charitable work. And, yes, um, yeah. I've been with them since 2007, over Lindra. And it's, it's the same kind of thought process that I've adapted with them as I've done in life in general. Mm. Because charity is, is like anything else. It's very, very competitive. And, you know, it's it's all down to what you raise to help that charity, I suppose. Yeah. You know, and but what I'm doing is supplementing the money that they get from the NHS. Yeah. Um, and it's been a... When you see people come up to you and how they've changed their lives or saved their lives, um, is really, really fantastic. You know, and sometimes that's you think, oh, I'm fed up with doing this now. But then all of a sudden comes up and goes, oh, thank you for the money. You know, my wife wouldn't be here if, if it wasn't for you. Not. Mm. I don't know if that's the case or not, but they feel that you're helping it all, you know. So, and when we started, oh, I didn't know anything about fundraising. And then slowly I, I sat down and, and watched it and... Again, it's all about the people mm. because it's my job is to raise the awareness, and then it's the team in overall that goes and tries to latch on to the schools, tries to latch, latch on to businesses, tries to latch on to the people, like the cycle rides and the walks, and you know they're like the treks. Then once we have them, we've got to make that a life experience that they want to come back. Mm. And that's been that has been the case. The majority of people that I started with in 2007 are still there doing their bit. And the reason they're doing their bit is they yes, they've been touched by cancer some way, but also that it's a life experience and they feel that they're doing something good. And that's all I'm doing is keeping the awareness up and making sure that everyone's happy. I'll give you a great example, right? We're in France. It's boiling hot and everyone's kind of struggling and well, some are fit, some aren't as fit. And this is where there's boiling hot. I mean, then we cancel the it one day and then we, oh, whatever happens, they go on the grog then, so on, and to keep everyone sensible. <laughs> and there. But even there, you know, when it's like if people step out of line, I've got to just tell them. Yeah, yeah. Even in America, I said, look, you got to, you can't get lost. Get on, stop drinking the day. And so it's all that. So I'm, I'm still kind of a, a captain. So... I'm like walking on, there's about 60 of us and they're all having a great time and they're all enjoying the trip. And every night I do a speech, but as long as some of Linda does a speech as well. So there's, this is what we're doing, the way we're doing it. And then I'll just take a mickey of everyone and say how good it is and, and all that. And then we I was like walking on, I, I thought, what the, it's Tony Hadley over there, my spam little ballet, right? <laughs> Huh? Random. So like, okay. So and I kind of knew someone he knew. So I said, and I went up to him and he goes, Oh yeah, yeah, good. And what are we doing? And next thing, so that's all I did was I told everyone, right, get gold on your phone, right? Everyone. And then I had a beatbox. So as soon as I went, when you ready, one, two, three, and next thing went, gold. And then 60 people sang, right? For Tony Hadley, gold. It was just, it was gold, to be honest, right? It was brilliant. And then people still talk about that. Even Tony Hadley put it on his uh, Instagram. And although it's hard, people love it. Yeah. And they love doing something, which is, as a sportsman, you're used to like maybe going up the uh, comfort mm. zone. But these people are are out of their comfort zone. And then when they come, when they get out in a team environment at the end every day, and I get, yeah, and everyone claps everyone in, and tap them and they look broken. You can see the next day, they like, look like shit, but they love it. Once they finish, they absolutely love it, you know? And that's all I say, look, this is not, I don't any matters. This is a team effort. Yeah. The, how we win this, we've raised all the money. How we win this, we all look after each other, and we have no injuries. And that's the important, that is the goal. We all finish in one piece. We've done all the hard work, we've raised the money and we'll enjoy the ride. Mm. So, and you've got one coming up, haven't you, in August? I, well, we're doing a, because uh, uh, exactly. I've moved down west now, um, near my birth village. My mum's mm. still here, my sister's still down in Australia and my wife's here and the kids are in Cardiff. I just want to join and make the, you know, the M4 corridor Um accessible to everyone and bet, better for everyone who's got cancer year. Yeah. So we just do a ride from Cardiff to Swansea every year. Yeah. And we try and promote it and get sponsors and get a lot of people to do it and try and build it up because 
you know, I don't know how much money we had. I think we made 100, 100 grand the first year and it's fluctuated with everything and COVID and all that stuff. But it's just, it adds to the pot. So whether it's millions donated, whether it, or, you know, the, the little kid that comes to school wearing red, he gives a pound. It yeah, all helps. And, you know, it's, it's an amazing experience to go in there. I always remember my first bike ride on the Tom Crosby, who was the chief medical uh, uh, officer there. I said a speech and I, and I got very more. I remember sitting down on the top of um, Golden Gate Bridge and I looked up at everyone and we'd all finished and we'd all been okay. One guy had a bad bang, but he was okay. And I'd rung my mum and I'd realised my dad and my wife had passed away and I started oh, crying. Yeah. And, I, and that's what it meant to me, even in two, you know, in the first ride, and I was only going to do one, I'd done too many now. And then I remember at the end, I, I spoke, and I get emotional when I speak, and then Tom Crosby got up and he said, and, and I'll never forget his opening line. He said, um, I deal with death every day. I was like, oh, how to get people's attention. And, that, but that was, that's, and that's what we did it for. Yeah. So now that the people are brilliant, and I, you know, there's been people on the rise who have passed, and there's people who have, there's a funeral next Monday, there was a guy who's very close to me with cancer. But it all helps, you know, and it's like, what have we done now? I think we've started and we, we're, I think we're, I think we're just hitting 49 million now. Wow. Which for, which for, you know, where we are is, is absolutely amazing when you look at that other, other charities. But, you know, you just got to buy into it and make it. Mm. Cancer's horrible. And even the, the darkest place you ever imagine when it comes to you and the people and the family. But, you know, you've just got to keep on going and uh, we all muck in. There's an amazing team. Yeah. Amazing team. How can people get involved then with, with oh, this? Oh, if you look up at um, Valindra Fundraising um, on the internet, and there's all different varieties, you know, Rob, Rob, Rod Gilbert has walked and he had cancer in the throat. Now he's he's walking here, there. Shane Williams does bike rides. Um, I think we're, we're very lucky that we've, we've got a lot of, you know, cool ambassadors and patrons, mm. people from, you know, Gareth Bale, you know, down to I can't remember, you know Sean Holly and but even people I've been with on the rides who just there and people wouldn't know them but they're important yeah as important as I am or as Tom Crosby is as the receptionist is we're all one huge team and I do hate it when they go oh, Jonathan Davis is raised for no 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 it's not me it's all of us yeah and when you go into Valindra and see the caliber of people. That are in there, you know, treating those patients is just phenomenal. You know, it's different, mm. different world. I've gone all goose pimp oh, like, you know, yeah. it's just it is all. But as I say, you've got to meet them. You know, people. We have a great time. You know, we have a great time together, and it's very sad circumstances, and you know, people pass away, and uh, and it's horrible. But you know, we just got to try and see if we can get. You know, victory over cancer, we call it. And it's the same with the MND boys, with Kevin Sinfield yes, and Doddy Weir and Rob Burrow. You know, I had two mates who died when I was playing for Warrington, um, Mike Gregory and Paul Derbyshire. And it's just horrendous. And, yeah. you know, they're doing their bit for MND and I'm doing my bit for cancer. And it's really tough, but you've just got to keep that awareness up so people want to keep on giving money. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, well, uh, anyone that wants to get involved, the Linda, absolutely Linda get involved. fundraising, just look, V-E-L-I-N-D-R-E. Very well, she, but... Uh, no, we're doing a bit with great supporters, so it's been it's been brilliant. Fantastic. We'll put all the details in the show notes anyway, yeah, okay. so, so okay. we'll do all of that. So just before we finish, I've got a few last questions, okay. if I may. Um, so when you think about all the years of experience you've had, uh, I'm sure you've had lots of advice over the years. Any standout advice that's kind of really, you know, helped you over, over all these years? Yeah, I think, you know, what I said earlier, you know, don't worry what you can't control. That's one thing. There's enough worries in the world. So mm. just don't worry what you can't control. My dad told me um, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Mm. That's a good one. And um, I've always had a motto. It's like, you know, being bold or edited. <laughs> it's a bit mad. I, had a, I just walked past. I got a tattoo last week. I'm 61. I had a tattoo on my hip. <laughs> And it says, it's just like one life, live it. Yeah. So that's what that, it's kind of, you know, your, your, you know, the name of your show is, is absolutely brilliant. And I think you have to be brave and you have to be bold. And sometimes, you know, if you do those two things, you, you are brilliant. 
But you can't sit in your shell and think, oh, what if, what if? Because, you know, is if's the biggest word in the English dictionary, isn't it, I think? Yeah. So yeah, I, I can go, I can actually say that, you know, I've, I've done most things. <laughs> some things not good, some things brilliant. But as long as I've enjoyed it, people around me are happy. And, you know, you, you've given fond memories to people who have watched you. So, uh and, I, and I, you know, that's, that's all you can ask for, really, isn't it? Absolutely. Oh, Jonathan, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so no, much. No, I enjoy it. Well, the main thing now is I'm going to beat your husband <laughs> in golf next week. I'll come up against him. So we're playing pairs against him in golf. It won't be any nice people then. Just be very horrible to each other. Buzzy and the nasty five footer. Oh, my God. Honestly, you're going to you're gonna thrash him. I'm well, sure. No, no, we won't. But I look forward, I don't know, I look forward to that now as much as I look forward to when I was playing international rugby. You know, when you play with your mates or when you do something with your mates, it's just really important. Yeah. That you have that, that have those times and it's like, I'm really looking forward to it now because it's like we're compared to the veg <laughs> It'd be nice at the start and then as the, as the game goes along, oh, no, it'd be yeah. nice Is talk. this banter or yeah, is it I'll abuse? Yeah, I'll be gone then. I'll be gone then. I'll be gone then. He's going to be up at like five in the morning <laughs> practising his putting now, oh, honestly. It'll be brilliant. it be brilliant. I love it. Oh, fantastic. But no, honestly, thank you so much. I've loved our conversation. You've been really great. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. I, I love, I've enjoyed the business element of it. You know, it's like, it's, yeah, it's. I, I, I've, I've loved talking to the business people as much as I have the sportsmen throughout my career, and seeing you know, how the big, you know, corporates work. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's quite exciting. Maybe people think rock, uh, you know, sport is like rock and roll, and you know, this. It's odd. A lot of the business people really, when they see sports people, they're like, they're starstruck, aren't they? Mm, yeah, it's, it's just ridiculous how, how it all happens. But um, I think it's, yeah, people, very similar. Yeah. Very similar attributes. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so no, much, I really Jonathan. enjoyed it, Jeanette. Thank I really, you. really enjoyed it. It's been, uh, it's been fun on a beautiful day as well. I know, aren't we lucky? Sunshine in here in Caswell. Yeah, <laughs> Caswell Bay. What a beautiful spot. Very lucky. <laughs> Wonderful. Really hope you've enjoyed this episode of Brave Bold Brilliant. Remember, check out our new website, www.brave-bold-brilliant.com. You're going to find loads of resources on there that's going to help you with your leadership journey and with the businesses that you're trying to scale up and grow. So take care, everyone. And remember, there are no limits to your growth, but it is by being brave and bold that you're going to unlock your brilliance.